Thank you. Let's be seated, please. Honorable Speaker of the National Assembly, Honorable Togo Tijiza, Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, Honorable Rifilu M. Sipani, Deputy President Paul Mashatile, former President Thabo Mbeki, <laughs> former Deputy President Bale Gambete, <laughs> former Deputy President Pumzile Mlambunguka, Former Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, Honorable Amos Masondo. <laughs> Chief Justice Raymond Zondo. Deputy, <laughs> Deputy Chief Justice Mandy Samaya. Executive Mayor of Cape Town, Mr. Gordon Lewis, Hill Lewis, and the various heads of institutions supporting democracy here present, esteemed member of the Order of Inkamanga, Umama, who Dr. Esther Matanga. Distinguished guests and eminent persons, members of the Diplomatic Corps, honorable members of Parliament, and fellow South Africans. We gather here this evening in the province of the Western Cape in the sad aftermath of ferocious and unforgiving storms that have caused damage to homes, businesses, and infrastructure, affecting tens of thousands of people across the province. In recent days, we have witnessed runaway fires in KwaZulu-Natal, in which 14 people, including six firefighters, lost their lives. The fires also caused destruction of homes, livestock, and grazing fields. I spoke to the two premiers of our provinces earlier today, Honorable Njuli and Honorable Winde, and informed them that the thoughts of South Africans are with all those people who have been subjected to these terrible weather conditions as they work to recover and rebuild their lives. I have asked honorable members, the Speaker of the National Assembly and the Chairperson of the Council of Provinces to convene this joint sitting to formally open Parliament on a day that is full of meaning and significance in the lives of not only South Africans but many people around the world. Today we celebrate the birth of the founding father of our nation and democracy and a global icon of peace, justice, and reconciliation, President Nelson Kholishata Mandela. <laughs> across our country and across the world, millions of people are marking this day with deeds of service and solidarity. Through their actions, they are giving life to a fundamental truth that we derive our humanity from the humanity of others. Umuntu ngumuntu gabantu. Mutu gimutu gabantu. Mutu ndi mutu. 
munu imunu ivanu vangwani. We are reminded of this day that we have a responsibility to each other and that our well-being and our happiness cannot be separated from those of our fellow citizens, men and women, not only of our country but of the world. We are reminded that as we strive to progress and to prosper, we have a responsibility to ensure that no one is left behind. We South Africans are a diverse nation, a nation with different histories, different beliefs, cultures, and languages. Yet we are one people, and we share a common destiny. It is this common destiny that the people of South Africa have charged this parliament and this government to consolidate and advance their destiny. Exactly 50 days ago, the people of South Africa went to the polls to decide the future of our country. Ahead of the elections, they had expressed their concerns and their hopes, their wishes, as well as their expectations. Through their votes, they determined that the leaders of our country should set aside their political differences and come together as one to overcome the severe challenges that confront our nation. They sent a clear message that without unity, cooperation, and partnership, our efforts to end poverty, unemployment, and inequality will not succeed. Guided by this directive from the people of our country, political parties from across the political spectrum have elected to establish a government of national unity. In an act that is unprecedented in our democratic history, 10 political parties represented here in our parliament have agreed to craft a common program to build a better, more equal, and more just South Africa. They have come together despite their differences and differences they have. Came together because they share a commitment to a nation that is united, prosperous, and inclusive. Through a statement of intent, these parties have made a firm commitment to respect the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa and the rule of law and to promote accountability, transparency, integrity and good governance. They have agreed to a minimum program as the foundation of the work of the government, the government of national unity. The priority actions that arise from this minimum program received the full support of the recent cabinet Lekhotla, which was held recently, which brought together newly appointed ministers, deputy ministers, and premiers from all our provinces. It also brought together local government representatives as represented in Salga, directors general, and other key officials were also in attendance. These are the primary actions that we outline this evening that they decided on. Cabinet will be convening a further strategy session to consider the minimum term development plan, having moved from the medium term strategic plan, framework rather, the development plan which will translate the priorities that these parties have agreed to into a detailed plan, as well as the interventions 
that government will implement over the next five years. The medium-term development plan will set out a well-defined vision and strategic plan that outlines clear goals and includes specific measurable objectives and a roadmap for achieving them. These goals will be properly aligned with the budget, which will support the implementation of these objectives. In all this work, the National Development Plan Vision 2030 remains the defining blueprint for our country's growth and development. We also draw inspiration from the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and the African Union's Agenda 2063 in crafting our medium-term development plan. The cabinet Le Khotla underscored the determination of all members of the government of national unity to work together to advance the interests of all South Africans. Without pursuing and promoting party political interests. It is about putting the people of South Africa first and foremost and advancing their interests. The Lakota noted with appreciation the commitment and great enthusiasm with which the newly appointed ministers and deputy ministers as well as our premiers have embarked on their duties. We will have seen many of them going throughout the country, immediately embarking on their tasks and outlining what their plans are. And some with great excitement and some expressing their joy at having been appointed. And we all should rejoice as we see them. Honorable members, despite the achievement of 30 years of democracy and the work undertaken over the last five years to rebuild our economy and our society, millions of South Africans remain poor, unemployed, and they live in a highly unequal society. For a decade and a half, our economy has barely grown. The people of South Africa today requires that we act together as the government of national unity, as well as all key role players in our country, and that we act with urgency, boldly and decisively. The government of national unity has resolved to dedicate the next five years to actions that will advance three strategic priorities. Firstly, to drive inclusive growth and job creation. Secondly, to reduce poverty and tackle the high cost of living. And thirdly, to build a capable, ethical, and developmental state. We have decided to place inclusive economic growth at the center of the work of the Government of National Unity and at the top of our national agenda. Our experience over the past 30 years has shown that when our economy grows, jobs are created. When our economy contracts, there is no job creation, and in fact, some jobs are lost. The government of national unity will pursue every action that contributes to sustainable, rapid economic growth and remove every obstacle that stands in the way of growth. We are determined that growth must be inclusive and that growth must also be transformational. Inclusive growth must drive the redistribution of wealth 
as well as opportunity. It must support the empowerment of black South Africans and women and all those who in the past had been relegated to the fringes of our nation's economy. This is part of the constitutional imperative to redress the imbalances of the past and deal with the slow process of development. Through empowerment and transformation, we can ensure that the skills, the capabilities, resources, and energies of all South Africans are used to the greatest effect. We will continue to pursue the programs that encourage broad-based black economic empowerment, employment equity, and support to small and medium-sized enterprises. We will continue to protect and uphold the rights of workers and continually strive to improve the conditions in which they work and live. Inclusive growth demands that we affirm the position of the women of our country and the young people in the economy of our country. Inclusive growth requires that we remove the social, economic, and cultural, and other barriers to the full participation of persons with disabilities and other vulnerable groups in our country. We will support the growth of rural enterprises and invest in public infrastructure in underserviced areas across our land. We will increase funding to land reform, prioritize the transfer of state land, and improve post-settlement support by strengthening the institutional capacity of responsible structures. To achieve rapid, inclusive growth, we will need to fix our struggling municipalities. Growth happens at a local level where our people live and work. Our municipalities must become both the providers of social services and facilitators of inclusive economic growth. They must work to attract investment in their areas. This approach can encourage businesses to expand and create more jobs in municip municipal areas. Investors are generally attracted to areas that have reliable and modern infrastructure. Simplifying and speeding up planning and regulatory processes can make it easier for businesses to invest and operate in a municipality, and this often leads to the creation of more and more jobs. As the national government, we have both a constitutional responsibility and a clear electoral mandate to assist municipalities in the effective exercise of their powers as well as their functions. We will ensure that the institutional structure and funding model for local government is fit for purpose and that municipalities are financially and operationally sustainable. Now this we will do because our municipalities have been raising this over and over again. We will put in place systems to ensure that capable and qualified people are appointed to senior positions in municipalities and ensure independent regulation. As an immediate priority, we will also bring stability to governance in our metros and restore the delivery of services. Many of our metros have faced huge challenges that need to be attended to. We have already begun with this work. When I visited Etewini 
metro earlier this year. I met with the residents of the city, with local business leaders and municipal office officials. They told me that they wanted to work together to build a city that they could be proud of again. We have put in place the Eteguini Presidential Working Group to enhance support from national and provincial government to turn the metro administration around and to fix the problems that they are facing in relation to infrastructure, water, sanitation, and also to focus on attracting new investment. This we shall do because Etewini or Durban needs to be restored to its former glory, and this we should do. We will extend the same approach to other metropolitan cities that face serious challenges so that our cities can become engines of growth and become dynamic centers of opportunities for our people. In the next five years, working together as the government of national unity, drawing on our collective capabilities, we will forge a new inclusive growth path for South Africa by pursuing a massive investment in infrastructure. Significant projects are already underway around the country in areas such as transport, roads, water in the form of building dams, energy, and human settlements. We will massively increase the scale of investments in infrastructure through a more holistic and integrated approach, positioning Infrastructure South Africa as the central institution of coordination and planning. We are continuing to simplify the regulations on public-private partnerships. This process had stalled for a number of years, and we are now earnest and focused in simplifying this very way of engendering good infrastructure investment. To enable greater investment in both social and economic infrastructure development. From our largest metros to our deepest rural areas, we have a clear intention to turn our country into a construction site. We want to see yellow equipment, yes, throughout our country and cranes, and roads being built, as well as dams, as well as bridges, houses, schools, hospitals, including broadband fiber that will be laid out as new power lines are installed. We must work to engender a culture of maintenance of public infrastructure and dedicate resources and establish systems to ensure this. Now, the culture of maintaining our infrastructure has declined over a number of years. We build infrastructure facilities and leave the maintenance thereof to a time when they have started to debilitate and collapse. Part of the process must be engendering a culture of maintaining right from the day they have been put in place. Now, as the government of national unity, we are resolved to intensify our investment drive, create more and more jobs out of quite a number of sectors of our economy. To create more jobs for South Africans, we will also focus on processing our minerals so that we export finished products 
rather than raw commodities. It is actually quite sad to see us continuing to ship out rock, soil, and dust out of the ports of our country, and yet we can process a number of these minerals and ensure that we export processed products, finished products. That is what we will be focusing on. We will pursue a smart industrial policy that focuses on the competitiveness of our economy and that incentivizes businesses to expand our exports and to create jobs. We will continue to work with stakeholders to develop and implement master plans to grow important industries, to increase investment, to create jobs and foster transformation. Now, we will also review the various master plans that we have to see whether they're becoming as effective as we had envisaged. We are convinced, we are convinced that small, medium enterprises and the informal sector hold the greatest potential for inclusive growth and job creation. We will pay particular attention to supporting small and medium-sized enterprises in our townships, in our rural areas, and in areas that need focus. We will take economic activity to where most of our people live so that more and more jobs can be created. Red tape debilitates the creation of jobs. Every department and every public entity has been directed to reduce the undue regulatory burdens that hold back businesses from creating jobs. And this is an area that our ministers will focus on in the areas of their work so that the various entities and the various structures of government ensure that the regulatory burden that we often impose on businesses must be eliminated so that our businesses can thrive and be profitable and create more jobs. We have demonstrated the value of public and social employment in creating immediate work and livelihood opportunities for many of our people. The presidential employment stimulus, the expanded public works program, and other initiatives under the presidential youth employment intervention have provided income, work experience, and skills development opportunities to many of our people particularly young people and women. We will expand and institutionalize these programs so that more and more young people can participate in job opportunities and skills development. Now, through the Presidential Employment Stimulus, we have been able to create nearly two million work and livelihood opportunities. Yes, this is true. If you go to our schools, our schools, 25,000 of them, benefited from the deployment of young people who came in as teacher assistants. Through this program, they gained a lot of experience they gained a lot of know-how, and they got into the world of work. And many of them are now better equipped to be able to operate in the world of work. We see great potential for growth beyond our borders. 
As we strengthen economic diplomacy with our largest trading partners and potential trading partners, we will prioritize the implementation of the African continental free trade area to increase our exports to the rest of our continent. The rest of our continent, the rest of our continent is actually a wide open opportunity for South African businesses. As one goes around the continent, you often see products from other continents outside of our own. And this can be a real good opportunity for South African businesses. Sometimes as one goes around, you even see water, water imported from Europe, from Asia. And one often asks oneself, why can't this be done on the African continent? And this is an opportunity for the most industrialized nation on the continent to export to the rest of the continent. We will do this as part of our foreign policy approach, which promotes peace, security, democracy, and development across Africa and advances a more just and inclusive order, world order. Over the next five years, we will seize the enormous opportunity in renewable energy for inclusive growth. South Africa has some of the best solar and wind resources in the world. As we undertake a just transition towards renewable energy, our country must create a green manufacturing sector centered on the export of green hydrogen and associated products. We must move into electric vehicles and renewable energy components. We have seen, for example, how the Northern Cape has already attracted billions of rands of investment in renewable energy projects. Work is underway to set up a special economic zone in Bukhubai to drive investment in green hydrogen energy projects. We have already a huge pipeline of renewable energy projects representing over 22,500 megawatts of new generating capacity, estimated to be worth around 400 billion rand in new investment. Investments such as these will inevitably create more jobs. Just this week, we saw the largest private energy project connect to the grid near Lechtenberg in the Northwest province with over 390,000 solar panels that will add 256 megawatts to the national grid. We will see more of these projects taking shape across the country in the months and years to come. As these investments reach fruition, more jobs will be created. Our Just Energy Transition Investment Plan sets out a clear path to invest, to invest more than 1.3 trillion rand in a just transition, including support for workers and communities in Pumalanga and other coal-producing regions. Our country is undergoing a renewable energy revolution that is expected to be the most significant driver of growth and job creation in the next decade and beyond. We also have a unique opportunity to position our country as a major player in the digital economy and create jobs in digital services. We will invest in digital identity and payments, expand access to affordable broadband, and increase training for young people in digital skills. As we pursue these new areas of growth, we will continue with the far-reaching reforms that enable growth. 
At the same time, we will launch our second phase of Operation Vulindlela, a government-wide initiative that has been essential in supporting and driving reform. It resides in the presidency and the treasury and the presidency are hard at work to lead the reform pre process in our country. But more importantly, it is a process that has seen to the breaking down of silos in government where various government departments cooperate together to ensure that we drive the reforms that we have embarked upon. In its second phase, Operation Vulindlela will focus on reforming the local government system and improving the delivery of basic services and harnessing, yes, harnessing digital public infrastructure as a driver of growth and inclusion. It will also focus on accelerating the release of public land for social housing and redirecting our housing policy to enable people to find affordable homes in areas of their choice. We will complete the most consequential transformation of South Africa's electricity industry in more than a century. Since the announcement of the energy action plan that I announced here in Parliament in July 2022, we've made tremendous progress also in reducing the severity of load shedding that beset our country for the long time. Now, over the next five years, over the next five years, government will focus on ex expanding and strengthening the transmission network, the electricity transmission network that needs great deal of expansion, but that also requires quite a lot of investment. To drive inclusive growth, we need an efficient freight rail network to carry our minerals, our agricultural produce, and manufactured goods to market. Through the implementation of the freight logistics roadmap, we will continue with reforms to transform South Africa's freight logistics system. Now, the work that we are doing with business and unions through the National Logistics Crisis Committee has already contributed to improvements in the operational performance of freight rail and ports. The well-being of our people and growth of our economy depends on another important issue, which is water. South Africa is a water-scarce country, and our water security is threatened by historical underinvestment in bulk water resources and distribution infrastructure. We will therefore continue with the institutional reforms in the water sector to enable greater investment in bulk water infrastructure and better regulation of water services and sources across the country. And this will involve, yes, the building of the dams that, whose construction in a number of areas in our country is already underway, and ensuring that the reticulation also takes place as we build these dams. Just as business needs water and electricity to operate, a growing economy needs skills. Where the skills we need are not immediately available, we need to attract people with the appropriate qualifications and experience to come and bolster our efforts. Now, in doing this, we will continue with the visa reforms that we introduced in the last few years to attract skills, but more importantly, to also attract investment and also 
with a view of growing our tourism sector that is so important. And we will continue to pursue a macroeconomic policy that supports growth and development in a stable and sustainable manner. Like many other countries, we have had to borrow money to support our budgetary requirements. We will manage public finances with a view to stabilizing debt. We will firmly, we are firmly committed rather, to steadily reducing the cost of servicing our debt so that we can redirect funds towards other critical social and economic needs. Our second strategic priority as the government of national unity is to tackle poverty and the high cost of living. An effective, integrated, and comprehensive poverty alleviation strategy is necessary to provide protection and support to the most vulnerable in our society. Even at a time when many companies are making large profits, millions of South Africans are suffering as a result of rising prices of everything they buy. As the government of national unity, we will look to expand the basket of essential food items Food items exempt from VET and undertake a pro comprehensive review of administered prices, including, yes, the fuel price formula to identify <laughs> and this we did for a while when the prices of fuel just kept on rising. We were able to find a way in which we could stabilize the price. We will seek to find ways of addressing this challenge. Asset poverty is one of the underlying causes of abject poverty in our country, and this exacerbates the high cost of living amongst our people. The provision of title deeds for land and housing provides people with assets that they can use to improve their economic position. Income poverty is also one of the underlying causes of poverty. The best way to deal with poverty is for people to have jobs. We have, however, made interventions to support the unemployed through a variety of interventions, including during COVID when we introduced the SRD grant. The SRD grant has provided a lifeline to millions of South Africans who are unemployed. We will use this grant as a basis as we move on for the introduction of a sustainable form of income support for unemployed people to address the challenge, the challenge of income poverty. We must ensure that local governments properly implement the indigent policy so that the old, the infirm, and the poor are able to get assistance with the payment of basic services. Now, this is important. And importantly, we will link social assistance with other forms of support to lift people out of poverty. As a country, we need to appreciate the impact that a well-functioning and quality education system has on both reducing poverty and driving inclusive economic growth. We will therefore focus on achieving universal access to early childhood development, which is a prerequisite. And this, honorable members, is a prerequisite for improved learning in later years. We will ensure schools are conducive
to deliver good education with enough classrooms, safe and appropriate sanitation facilities, clean water, and a daily meal for those children who attend our schools. <laughs> to ensure that we produce the skills that our economy needs, we will expand vocational and technical training in schools and post-school institutions. And in this regard, we will seek to take a demand-led approach to skills development. An important task of the next five years is to ensure that we also reduce the high cost of living through ensuring that everyone in South Africa has equal access to equitable, accessible, and affordable quality health care. As, as we implement the national health insurance, we will, focus, wait, we will focus on strengthening healthcare infrastructure, which many people during the debate and discussions on the NHI have focused, have said we should focus on. We will also improve the training of healthcare professionals and use technology to improve healthcare management. Now, while there is much contestation around the NHI, there is broad agreement that we must draw on the resources and capabilities of both the public and private sectors to meet the healthcare needs of all South Africans equally. In implementing the NHR, we are confident that we will be able to bring stakeholders together and that we will be able to resolve differences and clarify misunderstandings. Now, as the government of national unity, we have agreed that we will seek to build consensus around issues that we may not agree on. And there are a number of issues that we agree on. What unites us, we are united around many issues. And there are issues which we still need to find full agreement on. And yes, we will work hard to make sure that we do find agreement. Now, with so many people living far from economic opportunities and services, transport costs take up a large portion of many of our people's income and drive up the cost of living. We often hear reports that many of our people spend up to 40, 50% of their income just on transport. An immediate priority is therefore to complete the recovery of the passenger rail network across the country to enable people to travel from outlying areas to cities at an affordable rate. <laughs> Around 80% of commuter rail corridors are now back into operation and nearly 300 vandalized stations have been refurbished providing safer and more efficient services to commuters. The third strategic priority of the government of national unity is to build a capable, ethical, and developmental state. We will proceed with the work already underway to professionalize the public service, ensuring that we attract into the state people with skills and capabilities. And I need to pause for a minute here that as the government of national unity, key people who are appointed into positions of ministers and deputy ministers, as they got into the office, the public service officials have managed this transition period extremely well, and I want to thank them for doing so. We will continue 
to fight corruption and prevent undue political interference in administration of the state. In this administration, we will complete the work to restore the financial position and operational performance of our state-owned enterprises. We will complete the implementation of a new centralized ownership model for our state-owned enterprises. This will improve accountability, transparency, governance, and oversight, while reducing inefficiency and the potential for corruption. The establishment of a state-owned SOE holding company will give us even greater capacity apart from everything else that this will benefit us for. It will give us greater capacity to build a sovereign wealth fund. This has been done successfully by other countries whose sovereign wealth funds have built up capital from the high performance of their state-owned enterprises rather than from the fiscus. So this is an important move. Now, to tackle crime and corruption, we must have capable, sophisticated, and independent law enforcement agencies that can fight complex and organized crime. We will deploy modern technology to assist crime fighting. A data-driven approach will be used to identify violent crime hotspots, hot and inform the allocation of policing resources alongside prevention measures. We will continue to tackle priority crimes like illegal mining, gang violence, cash and transit heists, and the construction mafia through specialized police units. Now, we will continue to implement the National Strategic Plan on Gender-Based Violence and Femicide. And we will expand victim support services like the Tutuzela Centers and GBV desks in police stations. Now, 30 years ago, 30 years ago, President Nelson Mandela stood before this house to reflect on the first 100 days of the first government of national unity. Recognizing the different views of the diverse parties within that government of national unity, he said, what brings us together is the overriding commitment to a joint national effort to reconcile our nation and to improve its well-being." Close quotes. The same may be said of this government of national unity that has now been established by 10 of the parties represented in this parliament. We share a commitment to reconcile our nation by advancing social justice and equal prosperity for all. We are committed to improve the well-being of our country and its people through inclusive growth, the creation of jobs, and the reduction of poverty. This is an undertaking that should involve all of us. On the occasion of the presidential inauguration, I made a commitment that we should work together to hold a national dialogue, to discuss the critical challenges facing our country, and to agree on what we all need to do to achieve a better future for this great country. Across society, people, organizations, foundations, and you name them, have expressed their support for a national dialogue. They have said it should involve all key stakeholders in the life of our country, 
representing civil society, traditional leaders, the faith-based sector, labor, business, cultural workers, sports people, and other formations representing the diverse interests and voices of our citizens. Following the example set by historic events such as the Congress of the People in 1955, the Conference for a Democratic Future in 1989, and the Codessa talks in the early 90s, and drawing on the experience of writing our Constitution in 1996, we envisage a national dialogue that involves extensive and inclusive public participation. As we have done at many important moments in our history, we will seek to forge a common vision and build a comprehensive social compact with a clear program of action to realize our people's aspirations for this beautiful country. Through this national dialogue, we are called to be agents of change, to be champions of inclusive growth, to be the creators of opportunity for all our people. A few years ago, a diverse group of partners and stakeholders from across society came together to consider various scenarios for the future of our country. These were called the Indulamiti Scenarios 2035. One of the scenarios that they painted and described was called the Recrimination Nation, using the image of the bird, the loud Hadida, as its symbol. This described a situation of inaction where our country's problems go unresolved and where everyone blames each other for South Africa's ills. This scenario painted a picture of our country going into decline. The second scenario that they painted and described symbolized a vulture. Painted, this painted a picture of a desperate nation governed by a populist coalition whose main objective is self-enrichment and patronage. Now, this scenario, this scenario which seems to excite people so much, this scenario saw investment confidence being eroded, the growth path being low, and unemployment and poverty and inequality remaining extremely high. These fellow South Africans also described a scenario they called the Cooperation Nation, which was symbolized by social weaver beds. This scenario paints a picture where after disruptions and protests, there is a coming together of political parties, the state, the private sector, labor, civil society, coming together in order to jointly identify priorities and leveraging the strength of each. There is change as this scenario plays itself out in the form of governance and reform that leads to the economy growing with more investment attracted, leading to the reduction of unemployment, inequality, and poverty. By establishing the government of national unity, by preparing, yes, for this national dialogue I've spoken about, we have deliberately set ourselves along the path towards a cooperation nation. That's where we want to go. And we would like all of us as South Africans to behave like weaver beds. Weavers are amongst the most efficient and gregarious beds 
in that they build complex structures together, but more importantly, they cooperate. And this is the way we should go. Despite all the challenges, despite our differences, despite all the headwinds that we have faced, as South Africans, we are called upon to remain firmly committed to pursue the path of cooperation, of growth and inclusion. We are called upon to behave like weaver beds, building nests, and building this big South African nest that will be able to sustain all the people of our country. Earlier today, earlier today, a group of South Africans, of South African climbers, reached the summit of Kilimanjaro. Now, as we know, the, this is the highest peak on our beloved continent. They did so in order of the birth of the father of our nation, Nelson Mandela, and to celebrate the 30th anniversary of our freedom. This effort that they got involved in, or they are involved in, is called or known as Trek for Mandela Expedition. Now, these climbers have been joined by other climbers from several countries around the world to help keep girls in school by raising funds for sanitary products and other needs. Now, this is an important part. And what they have done symbolizes what we should all take as an inspiration. Let their actions inspire us all. Let their achievement of reaching the summit of Kilimanjaro remind us that as, South as a South African nation, there is no mountain we cannot climb and no peak we cannot reach. One remembers what Nelson Mandela wrote in his long walk to freedom, when he said he had walked and he had had a long walk and he had climbed a number of hills and he reached this top hill and surveyed the beauty of our country and said he should not tarry too long because there are many more hills to climb. As South Africans, we can summit many hills if we work together and we rise together. I want to conclude by referring and paraphrasing the words of Martin Luther King Jr. when he said, let us rise up tonight with greater readiness. Let us stand with a greater determination. And let us move on in these powerful days, these days of challenge, to make South Africa what it ought to be. We have a great opportunity to make this country a better nation. The coming together of all these parties that have decided to cooperate. It's quite a historic moment for our country, and we must make the government of national unity work and function and succeed. I am determined, and I've been grateful in talking to all the leaders of these nine parties. I've been grateful that all of them have with one voice said, Mr. President, we want this GNU to work, and we shall make it work. Thank you very much. May God bless South Africa.